welcome to EPG Patashala. Uh, my name is Dugira Lavasanta. I am on the teaching faculty of Department of Linguistics at Usmania University, Hyderabad. Um, today's uh, lecture is relates to Psychoneurolinguistics course 10, uh, module 16. I uh, will be talking about introduction, history and scope of neurolinguistics. Uh, the objectives of today's lecture is to introduce the discipline of neurolinguistics through some of the questions it has uh, tried to address and to describe three major approaches um, used in studying these questions. Um, let me say a little bit about the scope of neurolinguistics itself. Uh, neurolinguistics belong to the discipline of neuroscience, uh, which attempts to explain brain mechanisms that regulate higher mental functions, including both verbal and nonverbal aspects of communication. Um, neuroscience has several branches, uh, many of uh, which I am sure you are familiar, neurology, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, neuropathology, neurosurgery, neuroradiology, neuroembryology, neuropsychology and uh, neurolinguistics. Neurosciences deal with various cognitive, systemic, cellular, sensory and movement related functions of the nervous system. Neurolinguistics is only one branch of neuroscience. It is uh, a branch of cognitive neuroscience which deals with the role of brain in processes underlying language acquisition, language processing and language disorders. What are some of the questions addressed by neurolinguistics? How does brain and nervous system support human communication processes both verbal and nonverbal? Is the processing of language different during the first and second language learning? Do structural and functional changes in the brain affect language use and understanding? in older adults, in what specific ways language gets affected after brain damage and is this uh, different across different languages? How can we measure brain processes underlying language skills like listening, reading, speaking, writing, signing, etc.? How to design offline behavioral or real time experiments in language processing? How to build computational models of activities involving language? What is the role of modality that is vision, audition in language processing? What is the nature of interface between language and general cognitive abilities? Uh, it is obvious that I will not be able to deal with all these questions in this lecture. I will focus on a uh, few uh, points, especially giving some idea about the history of development of neurolinguistics. And I will do this uh, across three major um, approaches um, starting with localism. This approach originated with Franz Joseph Gall in Paris. Um, his time was 1758 to 1828. Then associationism, uh, one of the main person associated with associationism is Karl Wernicke, a German neurologist. He subscribed this view um, about uh, which big eventually, I mean he was, um, he was born in 1848 and uh, he was there till 1905. These ideas of associationism eventually became connectionism much later. We will talk about that in another module. Um, uh, then third approach is holism uh, associated with uh, Hewling Jackson, an English neurologist 1835 to 1911. I will say a little more about each of these three approaches. Localism and I said Gaul is associated with it, the French uh, neurophysician. Uh, Gaul proposed a doctrine called phrenology, which is a study of a person's character in relation to external configuration of his or her skull. He argued that it is possible to detect the strength of particular human faculties from the shape and size of the cranium, the skull. And he also said that the faculty of words uh, was located in the frontal lobe and its primary purpose was to serve as means of expression. 
girl's approach gave rise to the discipline uh, eventually to the discipline of neuropsychology which is concerned with study of behavior in relation to anatomy and physiology of the brain another name connected to localism or localizationist approach to neurolinguistics um, as paul broca uh, 1824 to 1880 um uh, he encountered a patient uh, who could only say one syllable called tan he would just go around saying tan 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 so when he died broca operated on him dissected his brain and found an area in the brain which is damaged which obviously is related to his problem of expression and so broca said that that particular area which is the third frontal convolution in the left hemisphere is the seat of articulate language uh, and therefore uh, third frontal convolution um, came to be known as broca's area let's look at the picture of brain left hemisphere uh, notice there is an arrow pointing to the broca's area um, little later in 1874 uh, the german uh, neurologist called wernicke described another area in the temporal lobe called it which, which came to be known as uh, wernicke's area and uh, this is a, so broca's area is in the frontal lobe wernicke's area is in the posterior um, parts that is in the temporal lobe and this uh, area is, is originally associated with understanding comprehension of speech broca's is production wernicke's is comprehension so uh, basically this idea of assigning a given particular brain structure with a particular function is what is called localization or localism Now let's move to the next slide. Associationism. According to this view, connections between different parts of the brain are more important than the areas themselves. So the, it is the strength of the connection that uh, allows us to um, understand and use language. So brain centers involved in processing images, for instance, they have to be connected to centers involved in processing um, uh, heard sounds. which in turn have to be connected to motor area in the frontal lobe which uh, sends instructions down to our speech muscles to open our mouth and speak so they have to be connections between comprehension area production area production area to motor area motor area sends signals down to the speech muscles so it is these associations which are important not particular um, locations this is why it is called associationism so as i said carl wernicke and later norman gashwind talked about associationism uh, and also about uh, existence of a particular um, aphasia called sensory aphasia uh, resulting from lesion of associative fibers which are connecting temporal lobe to third frontal convolution in the left hemisphere that is the broca's area you see in the picture on the screen the blue area is the wernicke's area the red area is the broca's area and you see a band of white fibers connecting the two this association is what they are emphasizing uh, you know as playing an important role in language mm. functions um associationism continued uh, into later uh, ludwig um, uh, lich time um, 1845 to 1928 he also endorsed wernicke's ideas and confirmed uh, the existence of what came to be known as conduction aphasia in 1884 when he described a case characterized by severe problem in repeating words in conduction aphasia where the problem is with the connections which are the fibers connecting the wernicke's area with the broca's area when that those connections are affected patients experience problems in repeating and it, it came to be known as conduction aphasia and several other french neurologists um, and norman gashwind in particular supported associationism uh, and uh, in fact gashwind uh, published a book uh, called uh, disconnection syndromes in 1965 so associationism survived and it became connectionism later on so what is this connectionism and in what way is it different from associationism uh, forging links with computer scientists the neuroscientists Uh, turned what was called associationism into connectionism connectionism basically relies on the idea that the mind brain is composed of simple nodes say neurons 
and that the power of the system comes primarily from the existence and manner of connections between different nodes or neural networks. So, you see on the screen a, a very simple network model, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to explain connectionism has been shown to you. Uh, connections, uh, connectionists meaning people who uh, endorse connectionism, they argue against existence of rules, uh, you know, which is what generative linguists did. They say there is no need to posit rules. Instead, association, the strength of association in these connections between different nodes, node can be treated as a neuron. Uh, so, those uh, strength of connection is what is important. Um, so, then moving on to the third major approach to study of neurolinguistics called holism. Holism denies existence of specific anatomical brain structures that control equally specific language functions, which is what localism did. Uh, holism also is not happy with the associationism or the connectionism. Uh, Hewling Jackson, uh, who was a major proponent of holism, argued that cerebral lesions which cause aphasia result in what he called negative signs and positive signs. Aphasia is a sign of general cognitive deficit and not uh, limited to language alone. Uh, later, Henry Head and uh, Goldstein are also uh, agreed with uh, Jackson and endorsed the holism approach. So, according to holism, uh, the loss of speech in aphasia is loss of our ability to propositionalize, to develop propositions. Jackson makes a distinction between higher language functions and automatic um, linguistic processes. What an aphasic loses is the ability to use words in creating more complex linguistic uh, messages in coherent speech used in particular situations. They don't very, most of them don't lose the so-called automatic speech. They lose more complex linguistic um, messages, creating complex linguistic messages. Arnold Pick, uh, 1851 to 1924, uh, he was a German psychiatrist. He also endorsed Jackson's view about holism and stated that aphasic disturbances are connected to loss of propositional use of language. That there are two distinct moments when we are trying to speak a psychological movement and a linguistic movement in articulating language. Uh, much later in uh, Henry Head 1861 to 1940 uh, once again supported Jackson's view um, that uh, and said that aphasia results in damage to voluntary language not automatic language. These ideas continued up into uh, you know until 1960s with Kurt Goldstein who emphasized disturbances also exist to sensory motor processes in aphasia, not just uh, the uh, you know Broca's area, um, uh, the Wernicke's area, but even sensory motor processes are involved in um, you know language disturbance following brain damage. Um, in uh, 1941, Roman Jakobson talked of analogies between stages of language development and language dissolution in aphasia that there is some kind of mirroring happens between the way children acquire language and the way aphasics lose language. It was in his 1956 publication that Jackson discussed the distinction between paradigmatic um, versus syntagmatic um, you know, uh, disturbances. Paradigmatic are selection of linguistic units, problem with selecting appropriate linguistic unit, whereas syntagmatic is combining uh, appropriate linguistic units. So, paradigmatic is a vertical relationship among linguistic unit, syntagmatic is a horizontal relationship. In aphasia, only one of these two will be affected is what Jacobson proposed. So, you can either have similarity disorder which means uh, the patient is unable to select um, appropriate word and therefore, he experiences anomia, lack of ability to name things or contiguity disorder like agrammatism in which the agrammatic aphasic patient has problem combining units. So, uh, either selection or combination, uh, those are the terms that Jakobsen used in describing aphasias. 
in on the 60s in 1964 luria also came up with uh, a classification of aphasia uh, a three way classification sensory semantic and amnestic and eventually drawing again on um, Jacobson's uh, similarity or selectional disorders um, you know which Jackson called dynamic uh, and afferent type of decoding disorders uh, as opposed to encoding or contiguity disorders. So basically there is a uh, coming together of these ideas um, in uh, describing in typologizing aphasic disturbances. Um, now we have come into the 20th century in neurolinguistics. Um, slowly um, by uh, 1980s or so, we had neuroimaging techniques, electrophysiological techniques uh, where you could monitor brain waves when you are listening, speaking, listening to music, um, you know, or producing a uh, noun in relation to a verb, whatever task lying in the scanner. So, with the development of technology, uh, the neurolinguistics um, research. Uh, you know, uh, enhanced quite a bit and um, there is also um, uh, gradually consensus is emerging to say that we cannot separate language from general cognition, that there is a relationship between general cognition and um, language. Uh, this consensus um, which is em still emerging is uh, was made possible due to a number of cross linguistic studies uh, involving multilingual patients not just English speaking patients and also uh, studies of uh, cortical reorganization that happens inside the brain after you have had uh, brain damage and you are recovering, what exactly is happening in the brain with the help of neuroimaging techniques, you can monitor and see whether sub, you know, areas next to the damaged area is taking over the function. So, reorganization of cortical functions could be studied. So, many of these issues uh, will be elaborated in each of the next 14 modules. So, this module's uh, you know idea aim was only to uh, just introduce you to the major questions addressed by neurolinguistics and tell you the scope of neurolinguistics. To sum up what I have said in this lecture, neurolinguistics is part of cognitive uh, neuroscience, which is a uh, you know general term within which. Cognitive neuroscience is much larger, it deals with many processes, but neurolinguistics focus is on language acquisition, uh, language processing and language disorders. Um, we discussed about some of the major questions neurolinguistics uh, is trying to address and we talked about the history of this discipline uh, during the past century also uh, along the lines of three major approaches. approaches localism or localizationist approach which says that a specific part of the brain is responsible for a specific function. Uh, on the other hand, the associationism uh, promoted by Wernicke and later uh, you know Geshwin and others uh, says that it is the connections between two areas uh, which are more important than specific areas um, you know uh, that are important. In other words, um, in order to process language and use language, we do draw upon images from one part of the brain which have to also be connected to auditory impressions and then to the motor sensory impressions. So, associationism talks about connections across different areas of the brain. Associationism eventually in the 90s became 80s and 90s and all, it became connectionism. The last approach called holism uh, basically says that uh, aphasia should be thought of as damage to propositional speech uh, and not automatic speech. So, holism looks at uh, uh, language in a more uh, comprehensive sense of uh, complex uh, ideational propositions are what is affected when there is damage to different parts of the brain and the a damage can be in, in relation to selecting a particular representation or combining those representation. We have talked about representations as um, you know uh, the specific linguistic units or even words. So, when there is a selection problem, uh, the, uh, the brain damaged patient experiences difficulty in naming things, uh, it is a paradigmatic relation as opposed to agrammatism for instance can be thought of as combining those units. 
So, it is uh, this two way distinction uh, is discussed uh, in the third approach. Uh, if you have any doubts, I suggest you consult the e text for more details. Thank you.